Well, good morning, everyone. Isn't it nice to see the normal Weller back again? I'm not quite so sure, but good morning to everyone nonetheless. And I just want to welcome you here this morning to Lone Ends. Um, it's lovely for us to be able to be together. Um, I suppose in a week which maybe we couldn't get out as easily, it's even nicer to be together as God's people. Just before we begin, there's, I've just got a few announcements to make. Um, the first is to give formal notice of the election of a new congregational committee. The process will begin next Sunday with the publication of the list of voters in the vestibule. To be eligible uh, to vote in this election, according to the rules of the Presbyterian Church in Ireland, you must be a communicant member and have contributed to the free will offering in 2023. If you meet these two criteria, it's your responsibility to check your name is present and correct on the voters list, which will be in the church hall and the vestibule next week. And it will be there for the next two weeks for you to look at. Um, if you have any concerns, please do speak to myself or Peter. As well as that, just uh, another few announcements. Um, Messy Church will be on on Sunday the 4th of February in Khalid this time from 3 to 5. And, and again, it's on Facebook. There, um, there you can sign up, you can register. Um, and we love, again, we're talking about front lines. And many of us maybe have grandchildren, maybe um, neighbours, other people who maybe don't normally come to our message church. It'll be a lovely way to invite them to something for us to build relationships. So please um, do think about coming to Messy Church if that applies. As well as a, a big well done to the junior section in the, our Gardens Brigade Company who came in first place in the uh, local area games. And not to be outdone, the Boys Brigade also, the junior section, um, were winners in the dodgeball competition as well. So it's been a successful week for the BB and GB. But these are all our announcements this morning. This morning we come not just to hear what's going on, not just to catch up with one another, but we come to worship the Lord our God. As we do so, we are going to reflect on his truths and ask him to speak into our hearts. And so we're going to receive the words from Revelation chapter 19, and we're going to ask that God would uh, allow these words to revive our hearts and prepare us to worship. Hear these words, O people of God. <coughs> Praise our God, all you servants, you who fear him, both small and great. Hallelujah, for God Almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and be glad and give him glory. Amen. In the light of that scriptural command this morning, we're going to respond as one people that we are this morning, as we're going to sing our opening piece. Behold our God.
Just a reminder as well, even though the sight of this will put fear on people, I'm sure. Uh, just a reminder, uh, this is our data capture form, just so we have the right details for you. Please, if you could get that in the next week, we'd really appreciate that. That is really helpful for us, um, just to make sure we have the right contact details for you. And um, again, um, if you would give that, even next Sunday would be great. I'm sure many of you are now thinking, where did I set that? I'm sure uh, you have misplaced it and you can't find it. I'm sure there can be other ones given to you. But please do try and write a reminder, think about it, um, and bring them in next week. That would be greatly appreciated. But we now come and we approach God as we come to him in our prayers of adoration. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, as we approach you this morning, we come and we acknowledge who you are. And God, we thank you that you have revealed yourself as many different things. That you are the God who is our strong tower, our fountain of living water, our Father, the Father of mercies, an everlasting Father in heaven. But Lord, these are not just titles which you give yourselves, but instead, these are the reality of your tender loving care towards us. Lord, we thank you that it is by the grace that you have planted within us that we here have become part of your worldwide family. And as your people, we are secure, sealed by your spirit until one day we will take possession of our eternal inheritance. O oh, Father, our hearts have been made to magnify in you. And so as we come into your presence this morning, we ask that you would draw our hearts to you. We ask that you would speak into the depths of our soul and strengthen our love and devotion to you. As you have declared that we here are yours, may we in turn surrender our ways to you. Lord, as we come to worship you in spirit and truth, we look once more to the cross of Christ. For it is there where we simultaneously see the depths of our great sin, but also there that we see the greatness of your love for us. May Jesus be our boast this morning, for we know that it is only through him and because of him, not only that we know that our sins, past, present and future can be forgiven, but that we can come as children to our Father. May we not deviate from our identity, but it, may we enable to live lives that are worthy of such a great calling. Lord, in your word you remind us that if someone denies that there is sin within them, they are a liar. And so we come in that spirit of confession as we lay down our sins before your gracious throne of grace. Lord, we confess at times we have allowed fear to lead us to compromise or look for an easy way out. Lord, we confess at times we have told a lie rather than pursuing truth. Lord, we confess at times we have looked for instant gratification rather than resting in you. Lord, as we give you these our sins, we pray that you would lead us to genuine repentance yet people of God those who are in Christ may today may we look to the saviour again for your word assures us for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son so that whosoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life cleanse us and direct us to the path of life in Jesus in your name we pray Amen. Well, do we have any birthdays this week? <sighs> Isabel, you seem to be looking very suspicious down there. Do you know, it, it, there was some touts here, but I didn't know already, because you let, you let it slip to me, which is, which is a terrible idea. I'm sure you lost sleep last night just knowing that this bag was coming out. I'll give it a good shake for you. Oh, there's someone up there as well. Oh, God, you have to get that out. That's the way to do it. 
Oh, there's a few ones. And when was it your birthday? Uh, Friday. Friday. <laughs> Friday. But did, did you have a nice day? Lovely day and a lovely day. Very good. Oh, happy days. In Balamina of all places, yeah. it must be good. <laughs> well, happy birthday to you. And Heller, it's your birthday as well. I, I would say in, in Khalid, they're always a bit nervous about the birthday bucket, but not on Lone Ends. So. <laughs> okay, Heller. And Heller, when, when is it or was it your birthday? Thursday. Well, happy birthday. And I have to go, I've got another one to come over here. Is someone in the choir, is it? No? Oh, is someone in the, oh, someone in the group, I'm told? No? No? Oh, Isabel, you, your sources must be wrong. Either that or someone's telling a lie in church, which is a double lie. <laughs> we're, we're just going to pray now. Dear Lord our God, we come and we thank you, Lord. We, give, we rejoice in such days of birthdays, God. We, we rejoice that we are a church family here. And God, you tell us to rejoice together. We pray for Isabel, Lord, and we thank you on this special occasion that, that she gonna have her, has had her family with her, God. And, God, as she has celebrated with her physical family, Lord, how good that is. But Lord, to celebrate also with her spiritual family here, God, we pray that she may be blessed in that. And for Heller as well, Lord, we thank you for her. God, we pray that, uh, Lord, as you have been with her on her birthday, Lord, we pray that you may energize her and strengthen her and bless her so that she may continue to be a blessing in mums and tots, in her family, in her uh, extended friendship groups. We pray this in your name. Amen. Well, boys and girls, do you want to come up to the front to see me? <coughs> so how, how's everybody this morning? Oh, that's very good. You know, sometimes it's like, good. But today, you are all really happy. Are you glad the snow's gone? Oh, you are? What about you, Lucas? You like the snow? I like the snow. No, oh, you like the snow as well? Number one question, Lucas, wear the shorts on during the snow. Ah, uh, of course. Look, do you approve of that? Were, were your shorts still on last week? No? Oh, look. Disappointed. Because Luke was the other man who never has trousers on. So it's good to see his shorts on. <laughs> Clarify. Oh, dear. Look. Minister trying to embarrass you. I apologize. Well, did anybody do anything exciting this week? Did you, but anybody build a snowman? Uh, and did you dress him up or anything? No. 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 Was it, what was his nose? Did you make new stones? Or, oh, you use a car, of course. It has to be a car. And do you enjoy your day off school? Yes. Very good. Oh, yes, of course. Yes. Oh, you, do you like the snowflakes as well? Well, do you know what? Today, we've been talking about making a difference for Jesus. And I've got a story. So just want to sit down and listen. Because I've got a story about someone called Johnny. And Johnny was a wee bit like you guys. He was probably similar age to some of you. And he was someone who went to church every week okay he went to church every week and you know the sad thing for johnny was that when he went to school many of the people in his class didn't go to church and didn't know about jesus and sometimes he thought i will never make a difference there's no point and he felt a bit sad and lonely so he kept quiet but you know he was a wee bit like this here i'll show you this represented him out I'll colour this in and I'll show you it in a minute. I'll make sure I don't get in the communion table. I'll get in big trouble. So look, he was only one. And see all the others? He didn't really know. And he kind of thought, I'll never make a difference, so I'll not bother. I'll just keep quiet about my faith. But one day in church, the minister said, actually, God can use even boys and girls. 
And we Johnny went home and he thought, I'm still a bit scared. But he said, maybe if I tried to be the kindest person in my class, maybe I could make a difference. And so we Johnny every day, before he went to school, he prayed because he knew he wasn't very kind sometimes. He said, God, please help me today to be kind. And so Johnny tried to be the best friend he could. When someone was hurt, he was the first person to help them. When someone didn't have a friend, he was the first person to go and be friends with them. When someone else was mean to him, he didn't be mean back. And do you know what happened in his class? That as he started to do that, as he started every day saying, Jesus, I can't do this myself, it actually began to make a difference. Watch this. This is just normal water. Let's see what happens when he does it. As he started to be kind, that he started to be loving, that as he started to forgive people, as he started to pray for them, this had an impact on everybody who saw. And you see, his class was changed because one little boy wanted to live for Jesus. Do you see that? It changed the whole water. And boys and girls, you know, it's a bit like us. Some days we think, oh, well, I'll never be make a difference. I'm not like the minister, or I'm not that clever. I wouldn't know what to say. But you know what? Your school and your class could be different if each day you said, Jesus, help me to be the kindest person. Help me to be good. Help me to be listen. And you know when we do that and we say, God, help me? You know what can happen sometimes? People may say, well, why are you so kind? Why do you always help me? Why do you play with me when no one else wants to play? And you know what we can say? Jesus is in my heart. And you know when we do that, our whole class can change for the different or for the better. One person, a difference. And we're going to continue to talk about that in our series because I think you guys can make a difference in the classes you're in. And I actually think Lone Ends, whatever school you go to, can be different. So we're going to be praying for you that this week maybe that it could be the start of that journey. Do you think you could do that? Small ways every day. Yes? Yeah, he went to Bethlehem, didn't he? That's where he was born. And that same Jesus is with us today. He, I'm sure he did get cold because they, did, they didn't have so much, they didn't have very much money in those days. And he, he helped them as well in the midst of that. But do you know what? That same Jesus walks with us, so he does. And he's with us, even though he was born a long time ago, he's actually here too. I'm going to pray and then we're going to sing our, your song. Dear Lord our God, we want to thank you for the difference that you can make in our lives. And, and God, these, these guys in front of me are wonderful. They're great. But God, we thank you that when you work through your spirit in them, that they can make a difference in their classes, in their families, in their clubs they go to. God, help them to be kind, not because they're kind, but because Jesus lives inside of them so that you, they can make a difference and point other people to how good God is. We pray this in your name. Amen. Okay, boys and girls, it's going to be your song now. So if you want to stand up, uh, remember what it is in there. Yes, Jesus strong and kind.
Kids want to go to children's church. Last week in our, we started up our new series on the front line. And one of the things that we're doing is this time tomorrow in which someone from Ealer Congregation will just share a little video of what they do and how we can pray for them. And this week, last week we had James Hyde from Khalid and this week we have Jonathan Boyd from here in Lone Ends. John, I'm sure it's fun watching yourself. You know, I, I, I've had this experience on many occasions watching people watch me. So um, you'll understand how fun that is. But thank you to Johnny for sharing. Um, so if you want to watch, Johnny will appear on the screen. Everyone. So where will I be this time tomorrow? I'll probably be at the office in Belfast. I work for PwC, who are one of the big four accounting firms. But not a lot of people realize we actually have a lot of solicitors as well. And I'm currently training to qualify as a solicitor there. The client that I work for day to day is a large high street bank. And I negotiate the, the legal aspects of their supply contracts. And what that means in English is anytime somebody at the bank wants a fancy new toy, whether that's chairs for the office or software for the computers, they find someone to buy it from. And then I negotiate with them about the, the legal aspects of the agreement and then advise the business on the risk. So day to day, um, I do a lot of reading. I read the contracts, I mark them up um, and I go back and forth by email and on calls with the different suppliers, um, basically arguing with them about the, the legal positions and um, trying to get the best possible contract that I can for the bank. And then I'll uh, I'll do a report of all the, the legal risk for the bank and it'll be up to them whether they want to sign the contract. Um, so what I like about it there, it's uh, very varied work. Every day is different um, and every deal is different. They're, they're never, never the same. It, it can be quite complex at times, um, but that's, that's what keeps it interesting. And the people that I work with are great as well. So um, it makes a big difference when you get on with the people in your team. Um, so what's a pressure point for me there? Um, probably, as I mentioned, 
it's quite intense. Um, we carry a lot of different um, work at the same time. So I have about 20 of those negotiations all going on at once um, that I'm just sort of keeping all the plates spinning and, and going back and forth between them. Um, so that, that can create quite a lot of pressure. Each of them all think that they're the most important and they should be my top priority. So I've got to manage all of, all of them. And sometimes um, the people that I'm working with don't, um, don't do their jobs properly, which makes it um, difficult for me to do my job properly. Um, so in, in those kind of circumstances, it can be a bit overwhelming and you can um, kind of succumb to the stress and, and lose your temper. So um, it's, it's just about um, maintaining, kind of holding your nerve and, and holding your temper and um, treating everybody as, as you would want to be treated. Um, so what might be God's plan for me there? Well, in truth, I don't really know. Um, I have complete faith that God has a plan for me. Um, I, I believe he, he has a purpose for each of us and a, a plan for our lives and um, that I, I'm not there by accident. Um, but in my experience anyway, his, um, his plans for my life only ever make sense to me in hindsight. Um, I don't seem to have the wisdom to, um, to predict what's coming next. So um, what I do know, though, is that God used me in that job in a number of different situations where I've um, had conversations with people that I work with um, about God and about life as a Christian and, and why I believe certain things and live a certain way. And um, I absolutely believe that um, God put those opportunities in front of me and, and put me there in those situations to, to witness for him. Um, so, and, and you never know as a Christian as well, when, uh, when the next one of those things comes along and, um, often you can really see God's purpose for you in a certain situation in hindsight. So how can, how can people pray for me? Um, like I said, it, it can be high pressure at times and, um, the, the kind of work and the pressure can bring out the worst in people. So, um, I, I would ask in, in prayer for me that um, you just pray that I, I don't try to do things on my own strength, that I, I do them on God's strength and that I really show his grace to people um, when I'm working, that I, I hold my temper and, uh, and do the work to the best of my ability and, and really just display um, God through me um, in, in all that I do. Um, and that when when people start conversations, maybe because of that or otherwise, that um, I'm able to talk to them about my faith and um, really just witness and, and help them to understand um, the truth about who God is and, and what it means to, to live as a Christian and to, to be saved. Um, so I hope you find that interesting and thanks for listening. Thank you, Johnny. I think it really helps for us to see what people's front lines are that we can pray and it encourages us as well as encouraging them so if you do get a chance um to speak to johnny encourage him you know that's it well, we're here in our frontline sundays to encourage people where they're at day by day but now as we come to our, our prayers of intercession kind of next slide and uh, next slide again i want us to be praying where we are and here's the next slide is a wee bit of a view, you know, the overview of some of the places that are represented, houses that are represented from the both congregations. But look at those dots in the area. And actually imagine if each of those dots made a difference. How different this area would be. And I suppose that's kind of exciting, but it's also something to be praying for as a church. That we have been placed not in Belfast, not in Antrim, but we've been placed here in Lone Ends. We've been placed beside certain neighbours. We've been placed in certain families. And it's our job to be praying for their prosperity. And that's what we're going to do. I'm going to, I'm going to lead in prayer. We're going to give a bit of time so that you can think of your neighbours, think of the family members, think of maybe the places you are in. And take some time to personally pray for them. And then after that, I'll lead us in prayer. Let's pray. Dear Lord, our God, we pray and we thank you, Lord, that as we do come to pray, that we know that you hear our prayers, not because of wishful thinking, but because we know in your word that Jesus, even at this moment, is interceding, bringing our words to the very throne of grace. And so we pray, Lord, as 
as we come in this time, that God, that you will give us bold hearts. Lord, that come not just meekly asking, but come asking with expectation. And so just in the moment of silence, we think of the area that we live in, our neighbours, our family, our friends, and we bring them to you, praying, Lord God, they may encounter you. God, you have, as we've said last week, you have called us and scattered us. And as we see this image in front of us, Lord, we see how we've been scattered into the local community to make a difference. That you have blessed us with the gospel so that we can bless others through our love. God, we want to pray for each of us, Lord, that we would be that person. God, we pray that, that our area our lane if that be our families would be a better place because of Christ living in us and God for those who don't know you that Lord God that you would stir an interest God you're moving you're the one who draws people to yourself Lord in this area that you would move you would draw people maybe who have rejected religion years ago who maybe don't see its relevance yet are lost yet are looking for some meaning, know that you are the one. So often they've rejected, not you, but Lord, just external issues. And so God, we do pray into this. We pray through our frontline Sundays that we would feel equipped to go in the places you have put us. God, we want to pray for, for Johnny, Lord, and we want to thank you for how he has been able to share what he does. And God, we thank you for placing Christians like him in workplaces, like in banks, among as a solicitor Lord, and we want to pray lord just lord we know that's a very trying and testing front line but god we pray in that lord that his conduct to me be worthy of the calling that you have over him Lord, we thank you for the, some of those opportunities that he has had we pray you would bless them that you would go ahead of them and we pray for him and hope lord for the next uh, month lord we know that Lord, they're preparing to be married. Lord, and we pray as a fam, our church family that we would be able to bless them, that we would be praying for this young couple. Lord, that not just singly, but as they come to be a family, that, Lord, they will uh, just make a great difference for you. As we finish our time of prayers, there, there should be a prayer come up uh, on our slides. And we're going to say it together, if you can see it. So we'll say it together. Lord of all creation, Thank you that our everyday, ordinary places matter to you and we make a difference there. We offer to you the places where we live, work, study and play. May we serve you and bear witness to you wherever we are this week. And may we know your presence with us in these places. Amen. And wonderful saying that together, but may that be the reality. We're now going to respond once more to God's revelation to us as we're going to give our tithes and offerings. And as we do, we're going to sing our next item of praise, which is We Are a Moment. <clears throat>
You may be seated. Our scripture this morning, uh, oh no, we'll watch your video first, sorry. We're going to watch a wee video, just a minute and a half, just to prepare us um, for our theme today, thinking about wherever we are making a difference. <coughs> Ten hours a day. Six days a week. Whenever I'm needed. Every Saturday morning. I spend my time. In a place that matters to God. With people that matter to God. My front line. In the stresses. Successes. Problem solving. Tantrum resolving. <laughs> Laughter. Teamwork. Jokes. Tears. Boredom. Tension. Cups of coffee. Cans of coke. God is working with me. He helps me see what he sees. Put here by God. He knows the day ahead. This place is rich with possibilities. This is my front line. to our scripture reading. Um, apologies to those who did follow the, the reading plan, actually. Um, the serious thing, I got it wrong. It said Colossians, and I copied that down wrong, whereas actually Galatians today. So apologies. I just got them out last week, and the first one was wrong. But i sure that hopefully next week it will be the right reading before you to prepare. Um, so it's Galatians chapter 5, verses 13 to 26. So it's page 1072 in the Pew Bibles, if you want to follow on as well. This is the Word of God, and through the Word of God, we, we want to hear God speak to us this morning. You, my brothers, were called to be free. But do not use your freedom to indulge your sinful nature. Rather, serve one another in love. The entire law is summed up in a single command. Love your neighbor as yourself. If you keep on biting and devouring each other, watch out or you'll destroy each other. So I say, live by the Spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the, or the, or the desires of the sinful nature. For the sinful nature desires what is contrary to the Spirit and the Spirit what is contrary to the sinful nature. <coughs> <coughs> They're in conflict with one another. So they do not do what you want. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. The acts of the sinful nature are obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity, debauchery, idolatry and witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, declension, factions and envy, drunkenness, orgies and the like. I warn you as I did before that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the sinful nature with its passions and desires. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking and envying each other. <coughs> May the Lord bless our reading to you. <coughs> Mary's a student who's excited about the prospect that God may actually be able to. Yet she's been told, as he's been told, that her real mission will only begin when she leaves university. He's not really thinking about how God may be using her in the now. And as a result, has been missing opportunities all around her. Mark has been working in menial factory job for years. 
and he's bored stiff by the job. As a result, he's been praying that new opportunities would soon arise. However, for whatever reason, no job has seemed to materialize. And unfortunately, as a result, he's been wishing away his days until he eventually gets that job. In spite of no door ever opening, he's never thought that God may be keeping him there for a little while so that he can be fruitful in the workplace. And then there's Angela. She's a pensioner who's severely affected by arthritis. She's bought into, subtly bought into the idea that because of her condition, God could, couldn't possibly use someone like her. And so she's blind herself to, to the idea of God using her. For, but God is indeed using her. For each morning early on, she goes to her local swimming pool where she does a range of different exercises to leave her symptoms. And there she's done so she's got to know a number of people who are in a similar position as her. Angela doesn't see it, but God has put her somewhere that she can be used by him. All of these people have something in common. They haven't been able to see how God could use them just where they are. However, witnessing goes beyond just knowing the right answers. Or even saying the right thing. There's nothing more effective than others being able to see him. And so this morning we're going to think about how we could be fruitful for Jesus through modeling godly character. Perhaps something which isn't talked about enough in our society is the rule of character. Often in a job interview, the thing that you need to get out is you're, you're gifting your talents without very much reference to your character. I often wonder if that has a detrimental effect in our society. I think that one of the most obvious examples of the corrosive nature of undervaluing character is the high football team Manchester United. During the reign of Sir Alex Ferguson, those who played under the team were known for their character as much as their playing ability. Someone was not allowed to get bigger than the team, and if they thought they were bigger than the team, it didn't take them long to be shown the door. No matter how good a player they may have felt they were. However, since Sir Alex's retirement, this culture has subtly been undermined. As a result, Though they have spent over 1.5 billion pounds on new players, they've actually got worse rather than better. The money was obviously used for very talented footballers. However, many of them didn't have the right characteristics to make the team collectively better. In fact, that very team has been accused on many occasions of having a toxic culture because, quote, a few bad eggs. And you know, the same can be true of our faith. If it's just about what we say without going deeper into our very lives, not only will we as Christians be ineffective in our front line, even worse, we will be a bad witness to those who watch on. Bill Clinton once said this of Mother Teresa, and I think it's so true. It's tough to argue with someone who lives so well. Not true. <laughs> Do you ever like someone who's so nice it's hard to argue with? Well, I saw the truth of such a statement one time when I went to a funeral of a fr friend's father. As I sat in that church, it was clear that it was packed with the tight-knit community. He had come together to pay respects to the family of the deceased. But this man wasn't a local celebrity. He wasn't a sports star. He wasn't even a businessman. Instead, he was rather unimpressively a man who had been confined to a wheelchair for many, many years as a result of an illness which increasingly took his independence from him. Yet it was clear that this man had made a great impact, not just because of the fortitude in the face of diversity, but more than that, this man seldom missed an opportunity to bless and encourage others. And he could have been excused of thinking about his own plight. Instead, he sought each time to look out for other people. 
and the difficult front line that that man David found himself on in his godly character shone through and it was clear on that day I was there that made a profound impact on the local community it was clear from those who were in attendance that day that David could testify or those could testify it's tough to argue with someone who's lived so well wouldn't it be wonderful if this was a phrase which people said about us who are believers I'm not sure about what he believes about God but it's tough to argue with someone who lives so well yet this is not something that just happens naturally we, we aren't just born like this instead it's something that we must cultivate in our lives and so as we look at briefly look at Galatians chapter 5 we're going to look again at two words which help us to produce such fruit of godliness in our lives we're going to look at pruning and plant yet it's always more realistic when we seek to apply biblical truth not to just some abstract concept and maybe an everyday so humor me for a moment imagine that your front line in this very time is caring for an elderly aunt she's demanding she's stuck in her ways and at times she has a tongue that could cut you in half imagine in that front line what challenges that you may have or perhaps a better question is, how could you be tempted in, to react in an ungodly manner in that front line? See, it's all well and good us saying, oh yes, I always act in a godly manner. You put ourselves in such positions and we can see sometimes the reality is different. To be honest, in the pressure of our front line, often it is our sinfulness which is exposed. It could be our sense of entitlement. It could be impatience at things not going our way. It could be our instincts to get even when. It could be our snappiness in responding to being belittled. It's not that these things were absent before, but merely the pressure brings them to the surface. In order to cultivate godliness in our lives, we must be willing to prune our heart. That's what Paul is saying here in our passage. He says this walk by the spirits and you will not gratify the desires of your flesh for the flesh desires what is contrary to the spirit they are in conflict with each other so they do not do what you want here's strange language but this language of flesh is the sinful desires which are in us we all know them because we gravitate towards them even when we do we want to fight I'm sure you feel that war within yourself at times. You want know a situation and you say, I'm going to remain calm when I see them. Before long the red mist is there. Or maybe that time where someone says something and before you even realise you have bit back and you come away so disappointed. It's the flesh. See, within ourselves, we have that. Yet if we constantly give ourselves over without that without fighting, we will be ineffective on our front line. Instead, we are to fight. We are to fight for the godly desires to reign over our lives rather than these ungodly ones. That's why it's vital that we would actively prune these parts of our lives. Not just defensively when we see them saying, oh well, I'm not perfect, it's okay. Instead, when we see them, that we would genuinely fight them. That we would discipline ourselves to resist. Verse 24 shows us how we can prune those in our lives. It says, those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh and its passion to desire. See, Paul's not saying that when you see yourself feeling, try harder, beat yourself up a bit more and be nicer. That's not the gospel. What he is saying instead is that if you're a believer, that there's something that's happened much deeper in your life which makes change possible. See, before you were a Christian, the Bible says that you were a slave to sin. In other words, as try as you may, that you wouldn't be able to really, really change. Christ, when he died, didn't just break the bondage of sin. 
or didn't just forgive you, he broke its bondage over you. And so as Christians, change is indeed possible. See, through his spirit work in our lives, it's possible for us to say no to sin. And so this week I want to challenge you, on that front line where you spend most of your time this week, take some time to think of some of the ungodly reactions that expose yourself in your life. Maybe if they're not obvious, pray about it. Ask God that he would reveal them. And when you see them, don't just dismiss them. But Paul says, crucify them. That is a call to radical repentance of those ways. And not just that, but to turn instead to the Lord to break that stranglehold. You know, those things won't be broken overnight in our lives. In fact, it will involve a battle which will continue this side of eternity. Yet as we battle, as painful as it will be, it enables the fruit of godliness to prosper in our lives. Yet as well as this negative command, Paul also gives us a positive one in this passage. He's not just saying don't react badly. He's urging us to react well. In order to cultivate godliness in our lives, we need to plant ourselves into Christ. Contrary to the ways of the flesh we've spoken about is walking by the Spirit. Verse 16 uh, certifies walk by the Spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. See, the work, the w- work of the Spirit is opposed to the desires of the flesh. Sometimes we talk about this walking by the Spirit, we we think of a very mythical kind of way, but really what it's saying is that walking by the Spirit is walking closely to Christ, who the Spirit reveals in our lives. It's following His ways and praying that His desires will increasingly become our desires so that we will be used by Him. That's why as we look at the desires of the flesh and we compare them to the fruit of the Spirit, they're the opposites. Paul isn't just saying try harder. He's saying spend more time with Jesus. Because the natural flow of spending time with Jesus is that these things start to grow. It's how they increasingly react, or or how we increasingly react on our front lines. Because as we walk by the Spirit, people will begin to see Jesus work in us more and more. Because Jesus has said, we as his people are his hands and feet. How do people see Jesus in this day? Through spirit-led Christian way. Isn't that beautiful? Because you know the fruits of the spirit, they are embodied perfectly in Christ. And so when we live for him, people should see him more and more. To walk in the Spirit, we need to plant ourselves regularly in Christ. We need to prioritize time with Him, being nourished by His Word, not just reading it, but wrestling on it, applying it, pruning ourselves, asking of Him, spending time in fellowship to sharpen one another, being connected to Him in prayer. Such things will not happen by accident. Instead, they require that we crucify the flesh and so prioritize him. It will require us, as John the Baptist was able to declare, I must become less so that Jesus may become more. Only then will he be able to make that fruit in our lives. See, our time spent with Jesus is like the gym in which we train so that we can go out and do When I think of this, I think of a godly friend of mine who makes it their priority to get up extra early each morning so that they don't skimp their Bible time. Each morning she dives into the scriptures and she prays for her front line. And you know what shows? It shows in the vibrancy of her relationship. It shows in her heart for the lost. It shows in her hunger for God's word. I wonder what difference it would make in our lives if we similarly prioritized Jesus more and allowed him to shape our desires. Yet maybe you're here this morning and you're not in a position to grow in godliness as you'd want. Because perhaps you've never accepted Christ as Savior. 
And obviously godliness is not possible without Christ first coming in. Yet, if that's you, I have a challenge for you as well. I wonder if you, as you think of this godly character that we've described, does anyone come to mind? Is there a Christian who intrigues you in the way that they live? And if that's the case, ask yourself why. Is it simply that they're born as a nicer person? Or is it that you're seeing Jesus working in them? Recently I was talking to such a person. Someone who openly said that they're, they're not a believer themselves. Yet where they worked, they were able to see there was something in Christians that weren't in them. That person has started to ask questions about where that life. Perhaps today is the start of that journey for you. You see something that you don't have. And maybe you need to look to the source, not just the person. Let's pray. Dear Lord our God, we come and we pray. We pray, Lord, for this godly desire to live lives that matter. God, help us because it's hard. We're easily distracted. We can be lazy. We can fill ourselves up with the wrong stuff. But help us to want this more. And for those who don't have this, Lord, we pray that you would unsettle them so that they would know that only in Christ can they find what we, they're looking for. We pray this in your name. Amen. We're going to finish by singing, Make Me a Channel of Your Peace. the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us now now and forevermore Amen May God bless us to be a blessing wherever he's blessed